think Whitney won't be here today. I am. I'm on the call. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm double booked today. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't see your face or anything. That said you. Well, I'm sitting outside of uh, Olson Ellie Law Firm on the plaza, getting ready for a bar association board of governors meeting. But uh, um, happy to be on the call. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Are we live? Yes. All right. Good morning, everybody. We have a quorum, it looks like. Staff that we need is here. My fellow council members are here. So with that, I will call us to order. First up, minutes from last, uh, last meeting, which was back in November. Wasn't that long ago. They looked OK to me, for whatever that's worth. I didn't see anything that popped out that needed changed, but. Chair, I move approval. All right. I have a second. I'll second. Perfect. With that, uh, if there's any opposition, speak now. None? All right. Three to zero. So proved. All right. We have two orders of business today. Uh, these don't have to take too long. I'll try to keep it in an orderly manner. The first is legislative priorities. The second will be trying to pass through our governing body rules and procedures that we've worked on a few times. Um, so the first, the first up is our legislative priorities. Uh, Mr. Dameron, our lobbyist, has provided us with a um, priorities list of sort of where the council had discussed in previous correspondence that he gave us, things that we need to pay attention to. Um, he is on, the, he's on air today via phone call. Um, he can chime in when and if we have a question for him or he feels I'm getting something horribly wrong. That's okay for him to say, whoa, no, that's not what I meant. Um, my thought was to just briefly go over these primary issues um, if we have a change of position or something we want to discuss, we can, we can do that. If we're good with what's on here, great. Um, and then after we do that, I wanted to talk briefly about setting some guidelines for, the, for this committee for the future to be able to make sure that we're not sitting here in December doing this exact same process this way so that there's a little more uh, headway and so we can put something together so that it can be used as a, as a template moving forward. Um, so with that, I will just ask if, since Whitney is on here, before I start, if there's anything he wants to say before we get started, Whitney, this would be your opportunity. If not, that's okay also. Um, I've got a couple of issues to add uh, just for consideration. I can do that when you go through this list if you want to, or I can mention them now. Uh, yeah, why don't you mention them now, and then we can, we can get to them. Okay. I've, uh, I've had a couple of calls with the city. And I uh, was on one last week with the proponents of redeveloping the Manager Hill Clock Tower project. Um, that entity is going to be seeking probably some state money. Um, if, if they go down that path, they're looking, I think, maybe at retaining a lobbyist. That may be something that we want to come in, at least secondarily, and express our support for that redevelopment. I, I don't know what their chances are of actually getting state money to help close that gap, but I know they would appreciate the support of the city and uh, the delegation. So I mentioned that. And then um, uh, earlier this week, the interim tax committee met, and one of the things that they are stumbling through, um, and I say that with purpose, is trying to get their arms around some kind of a, a Tabor taxpayer Bill of Rights, like Colorado has, or something, a constitutional amendment to either limit uh, spending or limit taxes. It is definitely a work in progress. Um, they want to talk about it going into the session. I think it's something that the league and cities are going to want to be aware of as to what impact that might have on on uh, cities and counties and state and local revenue share, but that's just something um, probably to be aware of and, and monitor as well. So with Great. that, I'll just go back and listen. I'll add those to the end and we'll we'll make sure we hit them on the, on the way out. All right, I guess we'll just start these and please at any time, Tony or Hannah, if you, please speak up if I don't see you or something, say, hey, it's okay. Um, so the first is the issue of docking. Uh, obviously, we as a council have never had a full discussion on this. I, I think it's hard for us here to take a, an official position on whether it should be three floors or seven floors or 
And the legislative committee's already made one recommendation that will probably be changed. I think the, the city's position at this point on record is going down to three floors. Um, I, I guess I'm don't I, I that's fine with me from some perspective if the, if the if the governing body as a whole wants to change that they can do that as we send this forward um, I think our at least the position we can continue to take is that they need to do something with it <laughs> um, I would like to see us add and I know the bill and I don't mean the building as a whole and there's not that much of historical value in the building all right but there is some I would like our position to also include a caveat that the city, that the state make every effort to work with the city to preserve anything of historic value in the building, meaning if they can keep it into the new design, great. If they can't, come to us and maybe we have locations something could be moved to or a group that would step up and want it. I, I would like to see us include that as part of our position that historic preservation matters for any items of, of historic value. So that would be my one addition or change to the current policy in front of us on this document. Any other thoughts on docking in general or this position? No, I absolutely agree with you, Chair. Yep, me as well. I just want to, uh, like you said, I just want something done with it. I'd like that building to be, uh, to have people down there again and be used. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Uh, KDHE Lab, uh, I think I'm supportive of the position that's on here. I think they've already decided it's going to go out to K&I. I think for our purposes, that's fine. That's great. It's still staying in the city of Topeka, and that was the big fight, I think, at this point, and it'll still be closer to, to central Topeka a little bit compared to where it is now. So I don't have any issues with, with continuing this position of supporting the recommendation that's been made. Agreed. Yep, I agree. And that's also uh, close to uh, close to Washburn. There might be some uh, synergies there with students and stuff. Yeah. This is Whitney. I'll just add. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that it goes to K and I. I think there's still some possibility they go to parking lot four. I think that's the governor's uh, intent or request, and she's trying, from what I understand working with House and Senate leadership to maybe make that happen. So it, it could still come to parking lot four, but at the very least, uh, K and I. And I think from our perspective and talking with whoever it is, the businesses down here, the partnership, city staff, I don't think we're good with either of those two locations. I mean, I don't know that we have to take a, as you've outlined here, take a position on, no, we definitely wanted it one of those, we just wanted it one of those two, I think we could make work. So. Yeah. I guess on that one we can be right in the middle. You guys fight that one out. We'll make what we'll accommodate you. Whatever you decide, make it work. Yeah. Um, the next one it, it involves the ARPA funding and the and the Federal Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. That seems pretty straightforward. Keep keep supporting any efforts to drive our projects uh, home. I don't know if you had any questions about that. Um, yeah. Chair. Awesome. Thank you, Chair. My one question I had is I hear kind of conflicting things. I, I hear, and, and maybe it's this infrastructure money, and I don't know if the infrastructure money is that, is the second, is the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, if that's the yes. thing that was passed. Okay. Well, on that, well, I guess what I've heard is that money is going, not coming to us like the ARPA money did. That's coming to the state. So I guess, um, yeah, obviously we want to, um, Get you everything we can to get our, our fair share of that. Yeah, right now the the information that we have is most of those programs will either be a federal grant program, or they will send the money to the state, and then the state will set up a program to allow people to apply for the money. So I think the money's going to get out, um, and, and with the amount of money, I think we have a good chance of, of accessing some. But it also is um, it's going to be a competitive process to get that money. Yeah, that um, that money will go directly to the state. The state has not told us how they plan to allocate that yet. They will. They'll come up with a plan. I'm sure the legislature will have some thoughts on that, and then they will all have to work that out together. Um, the, the, the thinking is a majority of it will end up at KDOT, who will then some some form of them whether it's a combination of KDOT personnel and legislative individuals or a committee, will then put that out for grants and then divvy that, those dollars out that way. 
So, so our trick is one, following that process so that we think it's equitable to all communities of regardless of size, because <laughs> we're right there in the middle sort of. And the two, once it happens, we're on top of things and start submitting everything we've got so we can let them know. Because we're ready, as the city manager said before, we, we're ready to submit those things. We just, just tell us when and where. Um, I have recommended previously, and I will continue to recommend, once we know that process, if it does heavily involve KDOT, I think we as a governing body as a whole need to extend an invitation to the secretary and say, will you please come have a, con you and your staff come have a conversation with us about this process so we can outline our needs to you as a capital city. And so kind of stay in front of them that way. Chair, I might um, add in, if, if I could, <clears throat> had an update yesterday from the Department of Commerce, specifically on this issue. And we, we were told yesterday that the majority of it, as you suggested, was going to go to roads. But the other point of emphasis is going to be lead service lines. Which we know we need. <laughs> so you know, even, if we, even if we knock that off the list, that would be great. Yep, Councilman Emerson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, know, I know we can't get too far in the weeds here with this today, but uh, Topeka Boulevard, for instance, is a, at least it used to be a state highway. I don't, I really don't know what the designation of it is right now, but, you know, Topeka, Topeka Boulevard's a main, obviously, north-south all through town. And would that be something we could possibly get KDOT funding to, uh, to, to uh, help us redo that? I don't know why not. I mean, I, and I think that's probably one since it, it goes into the county also. We probably need to start talking to the county about, you know, if we need to put some joint proposal together for dollars so that we can cover the whole thing, uh, see if they're interested in jumping on that with us too. Strength in numbers, as it were. Bill Scott, Bill. Uh, Chairman, yep. uh, Topeka Boulevard, when uh, KDOT put in the bypass and all that other stuff on South 75. Um, a lot of Topeka Boulevard was then turned over to the city of Topeka. So anything running basically from city limits to city limit is gonna be the city of Topeka's responsibility and not KDOT Highway. Right, I just, I, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm in, in the context of being able to qualify for some of these funds if, if, if it's gonna go primarily to roads. That's certainly a main artery that we've got a need for in Topeka. Anything else on that one? Um, my only uh, chair, is not to run on at the mouth here too long, <laughs> but uh, I've also heard some, I mean, some people contacting me about what's happening at our airports and evidently the airport. And I, I know that's not, that's not maybe what, what uh, Mr. Dameron's involved with, but at some point I would like to see uh, some presentation from the MTAA. I, you know, they get, they got some of this funds directly and I, it's kind of just out here in this nether world. No one knows until they announce what they're going to do. And I, uh, I, I don't know. I feel like we should have some input on, you know, what's happening in Tar to uh, some huge economic development corridors. I think that's a good idea. In the two years I've been on the council, we have not had any sort of formal presentation from MTAA or update from anyone over there. So that would probably be good for all of us. Uh, I think uh, Chief of Staff has his hand sure. out there. Yeah, yeah I've, I've been attending as many of those board meetings as I can here recently, and I do know that they've received dollars. They are going to be redoing a renovation of the terminal, uh, the actual terminal there in Forest Field to bring it up to COVID standards. They've received a grant to do so. Uh, it's actually a very large grant, and they advise that they won't be using all that money for that. Uh, some of the COVID dollars are going to be used to re uh, tear down some buildings that uh, are not rehabable and have asbestos in it. So they're gonna use some of the dollars for that. Uh, that is also out at Forbes Field. And then there is some uh, utility work that they're talking about doing uh, up at uh, Billard Airport. But I do agree that a presentation from them on an update as to where, what they're doing, what they're using funds for. And uh, I've been working with them and had conversation with uh, Amanda Stanley on uh, terms of certain board members that uh, the city of Topeka needs to get cleaned up. Thank you. And Chair, if I could, I guess just, um, at, at some point, are they gonna bring that to us to talk about? I mean, I'm, 
I guess uh, you're trying to be diplomatic and stuff here, but we have a terminal that sets empty 99% of the time versus we have a, something right in town that has several hundred people a day use it. Why would we not use the money to redo a terminal that more people use? I, I, I guess, honestly, I, I, I disagree with that totally. I think it goes back to it's probably a good time to extend an invite to them to come have a conversation with us, hopefully in January. That would seem a, an ideal time to – December is a little too close with just three meetings. But I think if we extend that now, there's no reason they shouldn't be able to come talk to us in January as, as a whole body. And I would – I'll put that on the list of things to send to the chief of staff to, to request here later. <laughs> yeah, Thanks, Chair. Chair. Chair, that also be a good idea that uh, uh, I think it would be appropriate at that time for the government body to inquire as to status of recruiting an airline um, for the facility as well. Yeah, that'd be a good time for that update because I know there's several groups working on that together. Anything else on this one? All right, the next one is monitor legislative post audit study of government competition, which is a really long way to say, give tax breaks to people who don't, who don't think they're being treated fairly. That's, that's the short version. Um, so I went to a, a few months back, I actually went to a presentation um, with Kansas, uh, hosted by the Kansas Chamber that talked about this issue. And they brought in someone from, uh, the, from Washington, D.C., who's part of a group that's pushing these issues across states. And, it was a fine presentation, and I did stand up afterwards, and I did ask the question. I said, my problem is you're not 100% incorrect on your assessment of, of these issues. I said, but the only solution you seem to have is to just let everyone stop paying property taxes. I said, well, for a local government like me, that's sort of a problem. Are there any other solutions you have looked into that would level this playing field, and have you looked at the impact of local municipalities? And his response was, I kid you not, well, I work in Washington, D.C., the local municipalities are not my concern. <laughs> so right there, from my perspective, they lost a little credibility <laughs> because it sounds good, obviously, from a policy perspective to say we're, we're leveling the playing field if you're, you know, and, and we're reducing these people's taxes. But the reality is it's, it's a hit to us locally. Um, and, and I continue to tell my good friends at the legislature that it's fine to some degree if they want to limit or make changes to tax policy, but the only changes they've made over the last five years or so continue to take away tools from our toolbox without giving us any alternative solutions in that toolbox. And my frustration with this issue is that that's another one that does that. It takes something away from our ability without giving us any counter to deal with it. So, so I'm obviously very good with this position. And I think not just when it comes to opposing just these sort of uneven tax repeals, but we also will continue to monitor that report for any other recommendations that come out of it that would take away the authority of, the, of us local folks here to, to continue to set some rules. Because it, it may not just be taxing policy. It may be what you can bid for, or there, there's a whole list of other things they want to look at that are, some of them may be okay, some of them are kind of scary. So. So those are my thoughts on this one. I'm good with the position and didn't know if anyone else had any questions. All right. Sales tax on food is now on here. Um, I brought this up at the, at the meeting the other day. There's, this one has a lot of complicated parts. Uh, I believe the estimate is if they totally eliminate food sales tax, our concern is what, five, up to $5 million or something from our budget could be lost. That's not good. That's a pretty big hit for our, for our budget, obviously. Um, the political reality is they are going to do something very likely to the sales tax on food. Uh, I don't think it'll be zero, but I, who knows? I think the governor's going to propose zero, and I think the legislature is going to try to negotiate 1%, 2%, something to that. They may even come up with a sliding scale. So I guess we could just ignore this issue and stay out of it. My thought is we should at least take the position that's sort of outlined here, that the state needs to address the issue. We don't, don't necessarily take a position on what percentage it should be that they should eliminate it. We would just support them taking action, but also leaving in the, part, the local control portion of it 
and just focusing on the state portion of it and then giving us the ability to make some local decisions, which is I believe has how I read this position is, is what it's intended to do. And if I'm wrong, you can clarify that for me, Whitney, but I, th I think that's You're correct. It is. But I know this one's a little You're more, correct. can be a little more controversial, especially with our staff over here who's like, we get it, but oh my gosh, <laughs> we're gonna lose money. <laughs> and we can't, we, we can't uh, ignore that, that part of it. But like I said, they're going to do something. So I always have the position of, I'd like to be in the room as part of that conversation if we can be versus, well, we just don't have a position and see you later. So any thoughts? Yep, Council right. Anderson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess, you know, I believe this, the state portion of sales tax, a lot of people don't realize this is six and a half percent, right? Yep. And us and the county combined are 2.65, if my math is right. Something like that, yeah, that's close. So I guess my, my position, this is just off the cuff, but you know, if the, if the state took the 6.5%, that'd be a huge savings for most people. Um, you know, leave, leave, leave our 2.65% or if, if the state wants to take that away, how about they help us by paying like some pilot fees on the buildings here in town? That yeah, that might be a, that might be something if they really want to help. Maybe that's a uh, a trade we could make. Yeah, yeah, and I think this position does that. It it says let let's let us keep the sale, and then if a local municipality want, is in a position where they can make that change, they can make that change. You know that that'll be up to them. But as usual, and we see this all the time, the, the God bless the legislature. They love state control from the feds, but when it comes to local control from the state to the cities, it's a little more, it's a little more gray area. But I think this position is tenable and we'll, I know we'll keep in contact with and work with the league of municipalities to, to sort of stay in line with that position too. Any other questions on that one? The next one, I don't think anyone's opposed to us continuing for broadband investment, right? No, no oppositions there, sounds all right. No one's anti-internet around here yet. Um, and then the home rule and other priorities continues to support the uh, not letting them limit our home rule, which we've discussed now on several of these issues. Any questions on that one? Those are the big ones. There's a few carryover issues. Um, I think on this legislation that's already there, I'm not gonna go through each of those. We, we've already sort of had positions on that. Uh, Basically, this just keeps those moving forward and, and also has us starting to look at legislation for 2023 on the um, abandoned housing issues. So if anyone has questions on those three, go for it. Otherwise, I think those are just continued positions carrying over. And then the two Whitney brought up, I mean, uh, in regards to Menninger Hill, I don't think any of us are opposed to redevelopment of Menninger Hill. I think our, our concern has been, and we're going to see this with a few other projects coming our way, is we want, every, we, we want it to be a working community effort because the city simply doesn't have the dollars to step in and, and take it over. But I can't imagine our position shouldn't be, yes, if somebody wants to go get state money and we can stand up there with them and find ways to get some state money, sounds good to me. I mean, so <laughs> I guess at some point, our chief of staff or, or city manager, are we going to have a presentation or get some information on this group? My only caveat is we don't really know who these folks are and we haven't really heard much from them. So I'm supportive of this with the caveat that I'd like to know who these folks are before we say they're the greatest people in the world and you should give them a bunch of money. <laughs> like yeah, who we're supporting before we support them. <laughs> well, the good news is they're a very reputable group and have done a number of projects. And I think that you'll find once uh, we do make that presentation, which I don't think we're too far away from doing, um, based on once we know what the gap is and the um, if it's not going to be filled by the state, obviously the city, we're going to be looking at where we can help in order to make it happen. Um, so we'll be bringing something forward in the near future. They're still wanting it to be somewhat quiet um, until they get a little bit further along. But uh, we could have some private conversations on that. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Like I said, so I, I think we're all supportive. It's, just, it's good to know who you're backing before you back them. <laughs> yeah. No, you're, yeah. Uh, you're, uh, Chair, this is a tremendous project, and, and what it does, it really uh, saves the Mitigar uh, clock tower for forever, in essence. And it's a really a tremendous project. But like city manager said, uh, they've asked us to kind of stay mum on the, on the topic until they get their finances and stuff in a position, and they're very close to that. So like city manager said, 
uh, some private conversations we had, but near future, there'll be something public and it'll be great for Topeka. Thank you very much. A chair, if I can. Yep, Councilman Emerson. <clears throat> Uh, I guess just uh, j just so I don't uh, I don't get accused of uh, of keeping my mouth shut until it's too late. <laughs> my, my one thing on this, which I usually don't get accused of, but uh, my one thing is that uh, if it's something that's in competition, you know, we just had this thing that we just talked about, private competition or government competition, mm -hmm. and I just hope if it's going to be something that other people in our community currently do, that it's not tax exempt. Right? They're going to pay property taxes on this. We can't. We can't keep having all these people come into town and, and basically don't pay property tax because eventually we need roads and we need fire and we need police and uh, anyway that that's just my position. I'm I'm all for it as long as they are not wanting like property tax exemption. They, one of the incentives that they'll receive will be NRP. We approve that when we approve the latest um, plan for the neighborhood revitalization program. Um, they are applying for that. There will be some exemption, but once that exemption expires, then they will be paying property taxes. So it is a property tax paying organization. We're going to give them an incentive, though, to help them to get the project done, and then they will be paying. What, what, yeah, the good thing going for them is they qualify for some federal funding because it's a historic preservation uh, as well as um, uh, senior living. So they get some incentive, incentives that uh, don't impact the city of Topeka, but helps them out very much. Sure. Okay, thank, thank you guys, appreciate that. Yeah, appreciate you bringing up the issue. Any other comments or questions on that? All right, and the last one, as, as, as Whitney said, this, this tax bill of rights is scary in the sense that he's right. They're doing it on the fly. We haven't seen anything. I don't think there's a position for us to take at this point, except to, except to direct Whitney to keep us informed as it changes, and it will probably change very fast and furious, and we'll see what comes out of it. I think much like the rest of the things we've talked about, if the state wants to pass something that puts all kinds of limits, restrictions, and changes on them, great. That's not our place to do it, but if they start dipping into our waters and restricting again what we can do once again, then that's probably a pretty good dividing line for us. And I know the, I know the League of Municip Municipalities will be on that heavily, and so we will lean on them and Whitney to keep us up to date on the fly as this one goes kind of crazy on everybody, especially in an election year, because this is a great thing for them to try to push for some of them in an election year. So God help us all. <laughs> Any comments or questions on that? All right, any other issues we have left off here that anyone wants to add? Free candy for everyone at Halloween, anything like that you want to No. All right. All right, well, then we will put these into a document that's a little more formalized, I guess. I don't know when the plan is to send this, probably the, I don't know, second or third week of December, I'm guessing, for at least the governing body to review it. Yep. Um, because the Shawnee County delegation meeting is the 10th, my plan is to put this in a resolution format for you guys today to get okay. it on the agenda for, set, for okay. Tuesday. That'd be fine. Okay. I'm ready. I'll be ready. Let's do it. <laughs> Perfect. All right. With that, and we, I don't, do we need to take any formal vote on these policies? I, a motion and a second would be great to okay. just to have me put it in resolution form for the governing body's approval. So, so moved. Second. I have a motion and a second. What she said, that will be the motion. Great. And there we go. Uh, any objections? As I hear none, three to zero. Thank you very much. We will, uh, I will do my best to present that in a much shorter fashion on, on Tuesday. Um, the second thing, and, and I don't know if there's any formal, I, I do think we want to take a minute because we don't want to be in this position again. It was talked about at the larger governing body of making sure that moving forward, we're on top of these things and kind of moving forward. And I'm just gonna lay out sort of what I vision for it. And if you have suggestions or ideas, great. If not, I will take all these and put them in a formal document that we can sort of give to next year's policy committee and, and they can kind of run with it and get some direction from the governing body. One of the things, and, and I did talk about this with our attorney and who came from the, from the league was they do a pretty good job of having what I call a living document. 
And essentially, it's always there, it's always accessible, whether it's the public or legislators or their own staff. And it, it's constantly updated. Um, I think we need to go to something that's similar to that, something that we can always refer to. I think it's good for us as a governing body to have that. Oh, what is our position on that issue the last time we, we took it? Um, and so one of the documents we will try to formalize is more of a, a living document that exists that each year can then, an issue can be added, it can be subtracted, or it can be altered based on where that issue is at. Instead of us sort of feeling like we're always reinventing the wheel every year and, and kind of having to start over, um, which also saves us a lot of time. Uh, as expressed by the governing body, we need to meet this earlier on this issue. I don't think we need a separate committee. I think that's what this committee is for, and I think it should probably meet officially on this issue every year starting in July. Um, I believe, does, does the league's meeting in August? I believe at some point then the committee should make sure that somebody from that committee attends the event in August where they have a specific legislative discussion with other cities and municipalities from across the city or across the state. Um, and then I think that gives us the ability to come back, touch on it in July, have that meeting in August, and be able to actually take something to the governing body uh, in September or October. Uh, October is sort of a drop dead for, the, for an initial discussion before it comes back. Uh, so that by the time you get to November, our lobbyist knows these are the positions. Because often these issues start coming up in December, or if there's legislation we want to introduce, it's always great to pre-file it uh, in December if you can. And so that's just kind of a that's just kind of a general idea, an outline of where I think we can go. And then everyone's on the same page, and nobody's scrambling like we are today. So, so that's my thought. Again, if you ever have suggestions or comments, but I'll, I'll put that into a formal document that can then later be adopted. Uh, both by this committee maybe early next year and the, the governing body if it needs to be adopted and kind of go from there. So any, any thoughts on that? If not, we'll move on. I concur. There you go. All right. With that, governing body rules and procedures. Oh, this was the exciting one. The good news is we have hashed out most of this document previously, but there were three or four issues left sitting on the table. Two of them were questions I had from other governing body members that were actually fairly good suggestions. Um, and the rest were, now that we have new legal counsel, she said, hey, wait a minute, and I agreed with her. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through those four things one by one, and then if I've missed anything, Amanda can say, you forgot this, or one of you can say, you forgot this. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the red line. We've, we've discussed all, these, uh, all the other red lines before. We've sort of preliminary approve them, so we're not going through every portion of it. We're just going through the things I think that we need to get a clarification on before we pass this out. Um, all right, the first is, and I don't have a page number, maybe it's page two, but it'd be 2.3, electronic participation. The last time we looked at this document, we had talked about getting permission from either the city manager or the mayor or the deputy mayor. Uh, and it came to, the discussion was, at the end of the day, we're all grown-ups. I don't know that we need permission. Uh, I think we just need a, to be able to say three times a year when I'm going to zoom in or use an electronic format, I'm telling you that I'm doing it. And if you don't like it, that's too bad. You know, I, I'm a grown person, and I get to tell you. So, so, our th our, so essentially, the new change would just say you need to notify the mayor, the deputy mayor, and the city manager, however you want to know, and just say, I'm 24 hours, minimum of 24 hours, I am zooming in today. Uh, and then there you go. You'll get your three times a year versus that method. So that's basically the change. It goes from just a, a notification as opposed to asking for permission. <laughs> Chair? Yes. Is there any reason at this time that we um, figure out if somebody's abusing that policy, as somebody who zooms into everything while she can, um, is there a way to go ahead and if somebody is um, abusing this policy and zooming in on all meetings has gone over the three, is there anything that we need to do spell out in this document at this time? Or is that something that we will have to just go ahead and deal with as it comes up? My thought would be we just deal with it as it comes up. Uh, in truth, if if uh, I will neither be the mayor nor the deputy mayor next year, so they will have to deal with this, or the city manager. Uh, my thought would be, once you've hit number four, you're just told, no. 
<laughs> we're not letting you zoom in. Now, that will be a, someone that one of those people in authority will have to say, our policy doesn't allow it. I guess you're just missing the meeting. Sorry. Yeah, and then at that point, we can all have a conversation about whether we thought that was appropriate or not. But <laughs> that's okay. sort of my thought. You know, I did. I think we've done the math before. We actually meet about 32 times a year, sometimes 33, depending upon the. So three still means you're there 29 times. And and the truth is, even with that, people are going to miss. Things happen. Life comes up. You know. So I think everybody at some point misses a meeting, regardless, once a year, just because of that. So, but yeah. So my thought would be no. I I don't really feel we need to put penalties in at this point. Plus, the truth is. That's a whole other process, and we would have a whole long debate about what authority we have to penalize our fellow council members anyway, and I really don't want to go down that road. That sounds great. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> uh, Chair, I did have a question. Yes. Thank you. I realize where this is in the document, it could be kind of, I guess, inferred that it's totally talking about city council meetings, but... You know, is this, since we're not saying, we're just saying three meetings, would that then, committee meetings would be part of that? I know that's probably not the intent, no, but should that be clarified? Oh, I see what you, because the document specifically clarifies later that you can zoom into all committee meetings. We have a section in this document that we previously approved that said, we are, we're, there's no limit on committees because we wanted committees to be more flexible and people to be able to attend those and, and if they need to meet more often. So I don't know. So I guess the question is, do we need to clarify that this is specific to governing body meetings or, or is it implied? No, you don't, because the first half states that it's the general rules and then the more specific rules are at the end, specifically talk about committee meetings. Okay. So. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, is, it, is it best to approve these changes one by one or just wait till we're done and that's truly them. the chair's discretion so <laughs> however you would like to do that all right my preference is we just take one vote at the end or two votes one to approve them and one to move it forward so all right any other questions on that are we okay with that change perfect yeah, i was just looking at the uh, the language in 2.3 it looks like it's saying two meetings are we wanting two or three oh, amanda it's three it says Does the it say one two the one that I had that um, Amanda sent last night, and make, it, it does say three in here. Oh, yeah, I probably that didn't look old, at that. We did talk about two at one point, so we've gone back and yeah. forth on that one. In the documents that we got with the meeting, it says two, but in what we got last night from um, Ms. Daly, it's, from, okay. it's three. Yeah. That's the one we want. I, I, the one that says three. I printed mine before I left, so I haven't seen the other. No, I think I have both <laughs> versions too. You're prepared. <laughs> but yes, our intent is three, so. Yeah. Um, Good to clarify, though. Yeah, right, right. Uh, all right, the next one is 6.3 as it relates to motions. It currently says, except as otherwise provided by ordinance, statute, or these rules, all motions shall require a second before such motion may be considered and may either be affirmative or negative. Um, I, I actually, uh, uh, Amanda has some question about this. I did too. You don't really have an, a negative. There's no, I, I won't say there's no such thing, but there's no such thing as a negative it's either affirmative or nothing or you don't get your second so or your so or your motion so i don't know the thought was just to eliminate the and me be either affirmative or negative it's sort of legal easy but it, it does make it a little confusing if somebody says well what's the negative i don't know anyone could answer that question <laughs> so no good point i, I would i would uh, concur with that chair yeah all right, is that halfway correct, Amanda? We got, okay. Yep. <laughs> it's hard to explain that which doesn't exist, right? Or something like that. Um, all right, we got stuck on this before, and I think we're still going to be stuck on it. 6.3B, stuck on it's not the right word. Um, I think there's some confusions as to... I think the way this is written, it doesn't allow you to um, make a further amendment to an amendment beyond the first amendment. And I'm not sure that that's what we intended, or maybe it is. I, I honestly don't know. I mean, tr truthfully, the formality of these things, if you look at Robert's rules and tradition is, someone makes their amendment, it gets its second, 
There's obviously the friendly amendment process. And then there's other people who say, well, I know what you meant, but I have an amendment to the amendment, and I'd like to make it, and you can vote me down or not. And I know that that can get confusing at times, although it doesn't happen that often. And I know that it can also extend the discussion, which, you know, we're here to have those discussions. So I think the concern is, at least my concern is, to be honest, is it limits the ability to do that. As a, and so I'm not sure what its purpose is. I guess that's, I would rather just keep it the way it is. If you want to amend someone's amendment, you have that authority. And if the governing body doesn't like it, they just won't give you a second or they'll vote you down. Um, so this sort of cuts off that ability, I guess, is what I'm saying. And my preference would be to go to not do that, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. <laughs> Try to clean it up, clarify. That's your, that's your purpose, Chair? Well, yeah, I actually think this, these changes, we would just not make these ch proposed changes, correct? I think what you would do to accomplish what I believe the chair's goal is, is you would delete the sentence, a motion shall be amended only once before a vote has been taken. Yes, okay. that is it right there. See, that is why you have good lawyers. Mm -hmm. We just delete that sentence, correct? Just delete that sentence, correct. And then we're okay. still cleaning it up with some of the language, which was the purpose. Like I said, I, I certainly know in the two years I've been on the council, and I'm sure some of the other, there aren't that many times outside of a friendly amendment or a suggestion to language that we have not spent too many times amending an amendment and then amending it again and again. That, that, that we haven't done that. It's pretty rare, so. All right, perfect. We will make that change. Um, and the last one, I'm gonna let her explain it. I agree with her. I think it's the last one, next to last, is, uh, what is it now? It's now new 6.3, it'd be G now. And it's in regard to calling the question. Um, the way it's written here, this would allow someone to call the question, which is a very specific rule, by the way. It's not just, this would allow discussion to continue. But the true intent of someone actually calling the question and why it requires two thirds of a vote when you do that is to try to force a vote at that time. I mean, it is a procedural action that people use to your detriment or strategically, however they want. Um, and it is meant to stop debate and force the body to take a two thirds vote to see if we're gonna call the question or if you get voted down and you wanna continue debate. This essentially, not only does it not conform to Robert's rules if we make the change, it essentially eliminates that. It says you can call the question and still having a conversation. Um, again, as a somewhat parliamentarian at times, I, I, I don't like that. I think we need to be able to retain the ability to have someone call the question. Uh, I will say I think it's only happened once, if that, since I've been on the council. So again, it's not too used. but. That's my concern. I would like to get it back to a more traditional, keep it as a more traditional calling of the question procedure. Yes, Councilman Emerson. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, my reading of this, uh, I, I don't remember the intent or if, if I was even on the council when this was adopted or not. Um, but I believe its intent is just to make sure that each person got to say something about the motion before before the question was called, but I, I, I do hear what you're saying as well. I think it's almost, it's almost uh, to me, it almost seems like a, a courtesy thing that you want to make sure everybody at least was able to say something about it. Um, I, so I, I guess I don't know if I feel strongly uh, about it one way or another. Um, as, as you mentioned, the only down, the only downside to taking this out is it can be used, like you said, strategically to sideline. And I, I just, I don't know. I, I, I just don't know if there's that many times that I, I, I care if, you know, everybody speaks on something, I guess. I, um, I mean, I realize from a strategic standpoint, it sometimes could be useful, but I'm not sure, I don't know, uh, an honest and full discussion with everyone participating, I think should be our, maybe our, our, our goal, but I, I don't know. Well, not, I don't disagree with you. I will remind you, it, it, still, it, it, will t it still takes seven votes of the body to make that happen, right? Seven? Right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> good, that's good math. Yeah. So, I mean, in that situation, if somebody called the question, it would take seven of our colleagues to say, I don't want to hear from the other three of you. And the, so, I, again, I feel like that's probably pretty rare. 
Uh, I think it is a good tool if we do get into a situation, though, where we've just run its course and we're all sitting there at each other saying, "This has got we've got to vote on this thing." It's the it's the tool to use. So, so I guess uh, you know because this doesn't stop once you make a motion and get a second. This doesn't all this this allows for all that discussion and hopefully the chair will make sure everybody's heard. So this this is a very formal request by someone to say to have to publicly say I don't really want to hear from anybody anymore and I want six of you to agree with me and let's do it. Uh, so so it is a little more harsher and stricter than than just allowing debate. Uh, I don't know, Chair, and I I totally agree with you there. I just I just don't know if this has been shown to be a, a problem that we've had. So I, I frankly would be in favor of leaving it as is, even though I know it kind of skirts the intent of, you know, to call the question. Uh, on the other hand, you know, some bodies that may have these rules may have, you know, if you've done Model UN or, you know, some of those larger things, there's 400 members or whatever. And so it's a little, uh, you know, but we have 10 people and normally it's just not an issue. And I, I personally like the courtesy it extends to all of us to, to, to be able to at least, um, Please tell our say our piece on something. Sure. But, but that's just me. No, it's fine. I mean, I'm I'm not going to die on this sword, and so <laughs> you know, if the two of you want to keep it as is, that's fine. I'm not going to. We we can put it before yeah. our guest governing body and keep it as is. Yeah, chair. I think I think we should go ahead, and this might be something we do revisit in the future. But um, I do want to make sure that we're preserving the right to make sure that everybody does get to talk. But yeah, since it's like you said, in our we've had the same tenure, in our tenure, it's come up maybe once, and um, I know that there have been past eras where maybe the city council needed more of that government, um, and so I am hesitant just in seeing the trend of um, politics nationally. It makes me a little bit. I want to make sure that we're preserving the right for every representative to get the chance to speak. So I think for right now, yeah, probably I'm glad you're not dying on the sword because yeah, I think we should leave it. That's right. You guys are nicer than me and I'm grumpier and meaner than other council members. So we work together. Well, thank you. Chair. <laughs> power politics, power politics. <laughs> All right. We will leave that as is. Um, and then the last one I had was 8.6. Um, I think it's 8.6. Is that? I think there was just a question. Maybe that's the wrong section. I think we just wanted to confirm. No, that was at the start. All right, somewhere in here we want to make sure, which we didn't address, that our, it is our intent to make sure that a quorum it c must consist of people in the room, right? Unless we suspend our rules. So we're talking, suspending the rules is a separate issue, which we've obviously have done during COVID. So we don't all have to be physically in the same room to meet a quorum. But once we go back to not suspending our rules and these become our rules, I want to make sure everyone's intent, because I think it needs to be, is that a quorum must consist of the people in the physical room together. Now, if there's an emergency situation or we suspend our rules again, again, that won't apply. But basic standard operating procedure is a quorum is people in the room to meet a quorum. And that is specifically for governing body meetings. Correct. Not committees. Correct. Yeah. That seems logical to me. Yeah. So I think yeah. we all understood that. I just wanted to, there was a question as to whether that's truly what we meant, and I want to make sure it is. <laughs> I agree, Chair, but I don't see where that is in here. I mean, I did see that uh, Ms. Stanley asked the question. But I don't see where where that is in here. Eight point six. If you, if I may, I think I would recommend adding it to two point two quorum and just okay. making it very explicit because that's where you're normally going to look to see what the quorum rules are. Okay. And I, and I would be supportive of that. Like I said, I think it's just moving it around to where it's easier to find what is already our intent. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I don't see no. eight point six, and I realize that you know maybe Mr. Trout. No, eight point six was something different. I, I that's my last comment. That I, I messed up. We're we're back on okay. two point three. Apologize. Okay, no, no problem. So, so so Ms. Stanley is recommending we actually add something, some language in there to um, that the quorum has to be physically present in the in the the governing body wherever we're meeting. Yeah, correct. So 
like in 2.2 a six members of the governing body shall constitute a quorum and be necessary for the transaction of business we would just add um six members of the governing body in the same physical space or something like that correct yes yep. okay. okay yep that sounds great thank you like i said if, if we ever have an emergency situation or again another pandemic next year we suspension is a different different animal but that keeps us to the basic rules the last thing was 8.6, which we already discussed. I was just going to clarify and remind everybody of what is a substantial change in allowing committees to, if they all want to meet virtual, that that's now an option. Um, I think it's still a good idea, but I just wanted to remind that, that, was, that that's probably the most substantial change that's made in a lot of these rules in terms of how the governing body meets moving forward. So, Any other questions or comments on those changes or policies or? Anything you want to put in there about ensuring that there is proper snacks and candies in the back hall each meeting? Do we need that in these rules? No? Sort I think it's fun. <laughs> if not, then what I would do is take, I, I will move to approve as I guess we've amended uh, onto the governing body for consideration. And I will second that. Anyone opposed? No? Great. Then it passes three to zero. Uh, my goal is, well, I, I don't know what meeting, but to try to get these in place in December, uh, obviously before January, because I know that that is intent of many governing body members who do not have the desire to continue to suspend our rules starting in January. So it'd be nice to have these in place so that we, we know what the rules are starting in 2022. So that's why, that's why I wanted to get it done today. With that, does anyone else have anything they'd like to add, staff or council members or anyone else? I don't believe we will have another meeting of this committee this year unless the governing body needs us to meet. So it's been fun. It's been great. Uh, I will probably request to be on this committee again next year, whoever the deputy mayor is. Whatever you guys do is up to you. But let the world know. I will try to try to get back here. I think there's value in uh, serving at least a couple of years back to back on these committees because you don't have to refresh yourself on everything. So. So I will personally make that request. And with that, I appreciate everybody's hard work this year. Staff have been great. We, we actually got a few things done. So that that's, even makes it more positive of an experience. So Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays to everybody. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Nice job this year. Yeah, thank, thank you. Great job. See you on Tuesday. Oh, yeah, Tuesday. Oh, yeah. Two weeks without a meeting was nice. Oh.